Good morning. Good morning. I told the congregation last night that I want to personally thank the two pastors for taking vacation on the same weekend <laughs> uh, because I love coming here. I uh, was here for almost three years, I think, serving and helping uh, with Pastor Dave. So it's been a joy to know all of you, and it's always fun to see the faces. I don't remember all the names, but I do remember a lot of faces. So it's good to be here. I pray God's blessings uh, on our worship together this morning. Uh, I, there's a lot of announcements in your bulletin. I don't know which ones are high priority, so I'll let you decide that by reading them yourself. Uh, I was also asked to announce that the funeral for Rosie Marsh, uh, who died Wednesday, May 22nd, will be Friday, May 31st at 10 a.m. at Cedar Memorial. And then there is no information yet concerning the funeral for Bev uh, Marsh, Welch, excuse me, Bev Welch. So that's the information that I have. Also, since it is Memorial Weekend, uh, it's always fitting and proper. I would ask anybody who has uh, served in the military to please rise so that they can be recognized. I would invite whoever served to please rise. <laughs> Thank you seems so inadequate uh, for all of those who give of their time and serve us uh, for our safety and for our well-being. So we thank you uh, for that. Let's greet one another in the Lord, and then we'll remain standing for the opening hymn.
If you didn't have goosebumps coming in, you got them now. Thank you very much for that. What a joy. And it's with joy and thanksgiving to God that we gather in this place to worship the God of our salvation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We take a moment of silence for reflection on God's Word and for self-examination. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join in the responsive reading of the intro found on the front page of your service folder. Blessed be the Holy Trinity and the undivided unity. I have set the Lord always before me. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. You make known to me the path of life. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity and the undivided unity. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, Comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. He is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. Power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and blessing and glory are His. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Sing with all the peace Sing and 
Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity by the confession of a true faith and to worship the unity in the power of the divine majesty. Keep us steadfast in this faith and defend us from all adversities. For you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson for Trinity Sunday is recorded in the words of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. This will serve as the basis of our meditation together this morning. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. On your wondrous works I will meditate. The second reading is taken from Acts chapter 2. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, And knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. 
This Jesus God raised up, and of that we, are, are, we all are witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. we go. You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Congregation may be seated for the sermon hymn.
Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, what a joy to be with you in this place, in this special Sunday of Trinity Sunday. Help us to grow in our faith. Help us to understand what it means to see you and to have you as our God. Bless our time together. For Jesus' sake, amen. Congregation may be seated. My dear friends, fellow redeemed saints of the living God, do you know what an ultraviolet camera does? A UV camera uh, can record the spectrum of light that we can't see with our naked eye. Inspectors use EV cameras uh, to look for gas leaks at refineries, lest the gases escape unnoticed and harm the surrounding environment. There's a lot of things that we can't see. We talked about the wind in that reading. It blows back and forth, but you can't. All you see is the trees, especially this spring. We've seen the trees going like this all the time, it seems. Uh, but, you know, God is invisible as well. And even UV cameras can't help us see God. But there are times, though, when God did reveal himself to man. And one such person that saw God was the prophet Isaiah. Through Isaiah's eyes today, it's our hope and prayer that we'll get to see God as he is. And what we hope to learn today uh, is that this God that we have come together to worship, He is awesomely holy, He is totally forgiving, and He is mightily motivating. Our text for today, uh, the Old Testament lesson from Isaiah, begins with the words, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Now notice that Isaiah didn't start by saying, once upon a time. He didn't start uh, by saying, uh, once upon a time, a long time ago, or in a galaxy far, far away. No, he pointed us to a specific time in history when Uzziah was the king of Judah. He wanted us to know that what he shares with us here and what we're going to talk about today is real. It's not fiction. So let's get to it then. Isaiah said he saw the Lord. So what did God look like? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Isaiah uh, doesn't know because Isaiah doesn't tell us. The most he said about God was that he was seated on a throne that was high and exalted, kind of like this pulpit up here, high and exalted, and that the train or hem of his robe literally filled the whole temple. Isaiah also saw angels whom he describes as seraphim or seraphs, which means something like burning ones, and these seraphs each had six wings two with which they covered their eyes, two with which they covered their feet, and two with which they flew around. And as they did that, they called out to one another with words of praise for God, their voices literally shaking the whole temple as the sanctuary is filled with smoke. So although Isaiah doesn't really describe God, he doesn't have to for us to form an accurate impression about God. The lofty throne, the booming seraphs, the pungent smoke, and all tell us that there's something special about this God. He is truly an awesome God. Maybe it's, it's kind of like what happens sometimes when we're walking, probably not around here too often, uh, but a limo drives by and you can't see who's on the inside. Well, your, auto, your immediate reaction might be, well, this must be somebody of importance and significance. And then when you see the police cars escorting him with lights flashing and horns blaring, then you know for sure this is really something special. Well, that's kind of how it was. God is truly awesome. But he's not just awesome. He's awesomely holy. 
the seraphs said and sang about this God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. So what does it mean that God is holy? It means that God is totally set apart, or as we might say today, that He was kind of in a league of His own certainly greater than any of us, greater in power, greater in wisdom, greater in morality. And what's more, the seraph said that's God's glory wasn't just kind of hovering over the temple, but he said that it filled the whole earth. Think about that. That means it covers even the great state of Iowa, even Cedar Rapids, Iowa, even your house. And every single room in your house is filled with the glory of God, even if you can't see it. So how does that make you feel? And it makes you squirm a little bit. This is how Isaiah felt. Whoa, he said. And he didn't mean that, whoa, great, or anything like that. He said, woe to me, I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Isaiah was scared. His neighbors may have thought him to be a pretty good guy, but compared, when compared with this awesomely holy God, wasn't even close to what his neighbors thought he would be. Not this God. He is holy, holy, holy. The original triple threat. That's our God. And now Isaiah was standing in the spotlight of this awesomely holy God. And no one else was there to hide behind. Kind of like an ant caught in a magnifying glass concentrated beam of searing sunlight, Isaiah seemed doomed for destruction. You ever wondered why, of, of all the body parts, <laughs> Isaiah confessed, I am a man of unclean lips. And would we readily make that same confession that he makes here? Or do we at times think that, well, our little white lies, for example, they're no more staining of us than a, a milk mustache that you get when you drink out of the bottle? So I didn't tell my parents or my teacher the truth about why I didn't get my homework done. That's no big deal. Sure, I stretched the truth a little bit when I told my boss why I was late for work. But everything turned out fine. Nothing to worry about. So I don't always talk about Jesus to other people even when opportunities present themselves. And unfortunately, sometimes... I even use his name in a way that's not overly pleasing to him. No big deal. He's a big God. He can handle it. No. Speaking the truth, the whole truth, is a big deal to this holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. For he is truth. Remember what Jesus said, John 14? I am the way, the truth, and the life. But the thing is, you know, we don't even have to open our lips to make them unclean and unholy. All we have to do is smile at a dirty joke, and you know where your mind is, right? Anything we do can happen that way. So, what do we do about that? We are sinfully unclean in the same way that Isaiah confessed us to be. I believe if there's one thing that God wants us to take away from this message today is that it's important for us to learn or maybe relearn about him today that while an ant may be able to scurry away from that concentrated beam of sunlight, we can't hide from God's holiness. The contrast is too great. 
You might not feel the heat of His holiness now, but it will be revealed to all on the day of judgment. So what are you going to do about that? What did Isaiah do about it? Absolutely nothing. Because there's nothing that we can do on our own to get us into that right relationship, into a holy and God-pleasing relationship with our God. What we need to do is to realize that our hearts, maybe like Isaiah, maybe begin to leap right out of our chest. Maybe when those six-winged seraph flew at him. Don't you think maybe, what was, what was Isaiah thinking? He's got this hot coal, and he's coming right toward him with that hot coal. It's amazing, I believe, that Isaiah didn't scream out for fear of what was going to happen next. But you know, it's kind of neat here because he didn't scream out. Because if he would have, he might have missed the words that the seraph spoke, the angel spoke to him. See, this has touched your lips. Here it is. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Absolutely amazing what God said to him there through those angels and what God does for us. Isaiah not only learned this firsthand that day that God is awesomely holy, he also learned that God is totally forgiving. Did you notice how Isaiah didn't even have to ask for forgiveness? He didn't even have to reach out and take it from God. God brought forgiveness to him. And notice how he conveyed that forgiveness. He could have boomed out, Isaiah, stop your sniveling, I forgive you. But instead, he revealed that truth in a way that Isaiah not only heard it, but he felt it when that searing coal touched his lips. Why a coal? He tells us, doesn't he? Where did it come from? It came from the place where animals were offered in sacrifice. Blood bought sacrifices for the sins of the people. All of those Old Testament sacrifices, what purpose? A foreshadowing to tell us what was to come when God would make sacrifice of his son on the altar of the cross. Now, I don't know about you, but a six-winged seraph has never touched my lips. And I'm guessing every one of us uh, can say the same thing. But we have the privilege of experiencing something even more awesome than Isaiah did. It's right here again this morning in the sacrament of Holy Communion. Jesus, the Son of God, presses himself to your lips through the means of bread and wine. And with every bite and with every swallow, he whispers, see, I have taken your sins away. It's all been paid for by Jesus. You know, Isaiah, I think, probably marvels that you and I are so blessed. Because he had this experience only once. But you and I have the privilege of coming up to this table often and receiving the very thing that saved us, the true body and blood of Christ for the sins of the world. So why would we not go as often as we can possibly go? Is it perhaps sometimes that we don't think of ourselves as unclean people? with unclean lips and unclean hands and unclean hearts. Well, my friends, if you ever get to that point, and I hope you never do, what you need to do is go back and listen to Isaiah and how he describes this holy God to us. It's only when we see that stark contrast between the perfect holiness of God and the sin in my life and in your life, it's only then that we begin to realize how blessed we are to have a God who says, I forgive you. And he shows it to us by giving us his body and blood. And as soon as the prophet was assured of forgiveness, he heard God himself speak. 
for the first time. God said, as if to no one in particular, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? In other words, God needed a volunteer. But what was the mission? How difficult would it be? How long would it take? How much would it cost? All sorts of questions. Isaiah never asked the one. Before the words even came out, what did Isaiah do? He responded by saying, here am I. Send me. And I believe that's the third important truth uh, that we want to learn about God today. That our God is mightily motivating. And note how he does the motivating. (laughs) He didn't guilt Isaiah into action. He didn't frighten him into obeying him. He simply reassured and pointed out to Isaiah who was offer, who was inviting him to serve him. It is the true God, awesomely holy, totally forgiving. So how could Isaiah not respond like he did, being motivated by who this God is? Uh, I tried to think of a comparison of that. It's kind of hard, but perhaps you have a friend and you, you're in a car actually, your truck gets smashed, and your friend shows up to help you. He hooks on the smashed truck and drives it, to, pull, tows it to his house, and he fixes it, totally fixes it, free of charge. And then after you get the truck back, he says, you know, I've got an old couch in my house. I'd just like to get it out of here. You think you could help? Well, what do you think he would say? I don't think it'd take much time at all, would it? Because he just had his truck smashed, fixed for free. He would say, sure, I'll come. Let's even use my freshly fixed truck to move that couch. Now, my friends, we, like Isaiah, have been totally forgiven by this awesomely holy God. And he now calls us to serve him. I love the words in in Revelation 2.10. Be faithful even unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. So he calls us to be faithful, to serve him. What does God want us to do? (laughs) Like Isaiah, it really shouldn't matter to us, should it? Because of who he is and what he's done for us. It didn't matter to Isaiah, and he was given a difficult job. He was told to preach to that stubborn nation of Israel. Right up front, God told Isaiah that they wouldn't listen and that they would stubbornly refuse to repent and turn back to him. Nonetheless, he said to Isaiah, preach to them. And Isaiah did. My friends, we too have been called to witness to an increasingly stubborn and fallen world. We are to be that beacon kind of like this congregation has been for 140 years. We are to be that place of salvation proclaimed to people who know, need to know about Jesus. It's not an easy job that he calls us to do. But when we're tempted to ask, how long is it going to take? How much is it going to cost? Well, then look again at God through the eyes of the prophet Isaiah. And see him as he truly is, awesomely holy and totally forgiving. And this ought to be what mightily motivates us to be faithful in our service to him. Cheerful service, no matter what the mission, if it's simply to tell your neighbor across the fence about Jesus or a call into the ministry where you can proclaim that word to others, or maybe it's just something as simple as forgiving a hurt to someone who has done something hurtful to you. Or maybe it's as simple as keep serving those who never give you a word of thanks, but you keep doing it because that's what God would want you to do. And he's the one that is motivating you to be faithful in service to him. Uh, A UV camera, I think, would be pretty cool. (laughs) It would allow us to see God's invisible glory. Wouldn't it? Eh, Maybe not. Maybe not, because it would starkly point out to us our unworthiness and our unholiness. Tell the truth, I think it would scare us 
to see firsthand how awesomely holy God is. But thankfully, this holy God comes to us, doesn't He? He comes through the gentle whisper of His Word. As we sit at our tables at home and read it, or here in Bible class, Sunday school, or as it's proclaimed in this place, He comes to us through the water and word of holy baptism and shows us the power of His Holy Spirit in creating faith. He comes to us in bread and wine to assure us of the total forgiveness that we have and that everyone has. That's what he says. You are totally forgiven, and so is the rest of the world. So my friends, may we, by his grace and with his power alone, respond to the invitation that he gave to Isaiah. Who's going to go? May we all respond. Here am I. Send me today, every day. Help me to be faithful to you. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, may it keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus unto eternal life. Amen. Now I invite the congregation to please rise and turn to page 319 in your hymnals. Once a year we have the joy and the privilege of using that third creed that's a part of the church. We use the Apostles' Creed. We use the Nicene Creed. I think we don't use this because of its length every Sunday. But it's a powerful creed. A creed is a statement of what we believe. And it talks to us about this triune God that we are here to worship today. And we'll read it verse by verse. I'll do the odds, you do the evens, okay? Whoever desires to be saved must, above all, hold the Catholic or universal faith. And the Catholic or universal faith is this. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father, infinite. The Son, infinite. The Holy Spirit, infinite. The Father, eternal. The Son, eternal. The Holy Spirit, eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. In the same way, the Father is Almighty, the Son Almighty, the Holy Spirit Almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. Just as we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord, so also are we prohibited by the Catholic or universal religion to say that there are three gods or lords. The Son is neither made nor created, but begotten of the Father alone. Thus there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. But the whole three persons are co-eternal with each other and co-equal, 
so that in all things, as has been stated above, the Trinity in unity and unity in Trinity is to be worshipped. But it is also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages, and He is man, born from the substance of his mother in this age. Equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, less than the Father with respect to his humanity. One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. For as the rational soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ. Ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And those who have done good will enter into eternal life, and those who have done evil into eternal fire. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord of hosts, your ways are inscrutable and your judgments unsearchable. Through your word, give us an ever-growing understanding of the depths of your riches, wisdom, and knowledge that we may glorify you forever. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, our synod president, our district president, our circuit visitor, and our pastors have heard your voice calling them to be your servants. Grant to them the Spirit so that they can always say, Here I am, send me to whatever you ask. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, you delivered up your Son according to your definite plan and foreknowledge to be our Savior. Make our hearts glad in this faith that our, forget, that our tongues may rejoice and our flesh may dwell in hope. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord of hosts, you sit enthroned as king forever. Bless all who rule us in your stead with wisdom and understanding that truth and justice may prevail in our land and lawlessness may be kept at bay. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, we thank you for the many blessings you have bestowed upon this nation. Grant us a long memory to recall those who gave the full measure of devotion to our country's peace and security. Bring to mind the sacrifices of those who served faithfully until death in the protection of our freedom and in the defense of our land. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, uphold Joel Faye Allen's nephew, Daryl Axtell, Steve Balster, Heidi Baumert and her uncle Jim, Edna Bornstein and her son Robin George, Chuck and Pat Campbell, Carmody Catlin, Donna Cross, Eldred Gerhold, Don Meter, Mike Robertson, Mindy Rottinghouse, Chris Russell and her family Bill, Paul, Ross and Amanda, Daniel Shaw, Carol Stellwagen, Mary Stevens, cousin Ella, Eloise Weiss, Doran, Doran Welch, Bobby Wilkinson's nephew, Steve, Leanne Williams, and all who suffer in our midst by your truth, that since you are at the right hand, they cannot be shaken. Gladden their hearts, cause their tongues to rejoice, and make their flesh dwell in hope. 
Lord, in your mercy. Into your strong and loving care, we commit the Bayer family uh, at the loss of their son, 13-year-old Nolan, to a tragic accident Friday night. We commit also to you the family of Rosemary, Rosie Marsh, and the family of Bev Welch, especially for Doran, her husband, and all who mourn their deaths. Be present in their time of need and strengthen them with your unending care. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, take our guilt and atone for our sin by touching our unclean lips with Christ's cleansing body and blood, that we may not be lost, but abide in your holy presence forever. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us at, as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the word of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. For to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated as we continue with our worship of the offering of our tithes. Our path of worship takes two trails. First one is the Word. We've had the joy and privilege of having God speak to us through His Word uh, this morning. And now that joy continues with that path that goes to the sacrament where God comes in a very personal and intimate way uh, to assure us of our forgiveness. Uh, any visitors that are here today, our guidelines are printed in your service folder. Uh, if you would like to come up and receive a blessing, you're invited uh, to please fold your arms across your shoulders, the hands of the opposite shoulders, uh, and then we know that you are here to be blessed, and we are blessed uh, that you are here. And also, if you uh, need a... Uh, Gluten-free, I'll get it, a gluten-free wafer, you just have to show a fist, and then we'll make sure you get a gluten-free one. So I invite the congregation to please rise as we continue with our worship with the service of the sacrament on page 177 uh, in your service folder, in your hymnal. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. To give him thanks and pray. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, everlasting God. Therefore, with our angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink you all of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for you. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Now may this true body and blood strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Go in peace serve the Lord with joy. Amen. In this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith and a life everlasting. Go in peace. Rest assured God truly loves you. Amen. I invite the congregation to please rise as we join in the singing uh, of the hymn of thanksgiving. Sing his praise. Tell everyone what he has done. Let every heart who seeks the Lord rejoice and proudly bear his name. He recalls his promises and leads his people forth in joy with shouts of thanksgiving. Alleluia, alleluia. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive with believing hearts the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.